Hi everyone, before today's episode starts, I just thought I should let you know that there was a last minute change to location, which is maybe why the audio doesn't sound as good or as up to standard as it has been with previous episodes. Um, it's okay, you can still listen to it, there's no real big difference, but I know some of you might notice things like that, so I just thought I'd mention it. Anyway, on with the episode. I'm the Doctor. I'm a Time Lord. I'm from the planet Gallifrey in the constellation of Casterberus. I hope the ears are a bit less conspicuous this time. You might be a doctor, but I am. I'm a doctor. There's probably not the one who expect. Absolutely fantastic. All of time and space, everything that ever happened or ever will. Where do you want to start? Hello, everybody, and welcome back to episode. Five of Bigger on the Inside? I think it's five, yeah. I think that's right. And the new Who Dr. Who Watched On podcast, this week we have been watching what, Harry? Dalek by Robert Sherman. Yeah, I was one thing I was really surprised by that was the fact that it's not a Russell T. Davies episode. It's a brand new first Dalek episode in like 17 years, I think um, they said. It was the last time we saw the Daleks on a small screen 17 years prior to this. And it wasn't actually oh, wow. written by the head writer. Do you know why, uh, how Robert Schumann ended up getting this gig? No. Well, um, I- I'm sure it's more complicated than this, but um, <laughs> back when, um, well, not back in the days of Big Finish, because Big Finish has kind of kept going even when you Who came back. Hmm. But um, during kind of the drought in between Classic and New Who, um, Robert Schumann wrote a very similar story. Um, for Big Finish, in which it was Colin Baker versus one Dalek in some kind of, I think, military base. Oh, that's or, cool. like, abandoned. Yeah. And so, basically, I guess that, as a setup, was so effective that he um, was brought on to write a kind of ad- adaptation of that episode for Series 1 of New Who. Oh, cool. Yeah, because I was looking at some Big Finish stuff today, and one thing I noticed is a lot of missing episodes they still have the transcripts from them and have mm. then been done as big finish and there's a tom baker episode shadow which was recently um reanimated uh, as a mm. you know hand-drawn animation but yeah. you can go back and actually listen to a big finish version with paul mcgann oh okay yeah anyway so we'll get on to the actual episode so this was episode six half well i thought we were halfway through the first series there's actually 13 episodes not 12 Oh, right. So we can still, well, later on, we're going to do our ranking of the first six episodes. Yeah, I can mm. see you looking slightly worried, almost as if you forgot we were going to do that. But that doesn't matter. No, we'll it's because that. the reason is that um, I feel like the things I'm going to say about this episode are going to give away pretty early on where <laughs> this is going to be in the ranking. Okay, well, do you want to do the ranking first then? Um, yeah. Do we want to do top to bottom or bottom to top? We'll do bottom to top. So if you want to go okay. first. Okay. Well, for me, um, bottom, I'd probably start with the end of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, next in the ranking, I think would be um, Aliens of London and World War Three together. Yeah. Um, then Rose, oh, then The cool. Unquiet Dead, and at the top, Dalek. Oh, right. Okay. So ours are quite similar. How come you've put the um, World War Three and Aliens of London quite low down? Um, it's not that they're bad. It's just that I feel that um, with this with series one, mm. um, the standouts really stand out, yeah. and then everything else is, is like still perfectly enjoyable, but just to me doesn't jump to my head when I yeah. first think of series one. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, well, when I've done my list, I've split those two episodes up. So I'll do my list from the very bottom. My okay. list starts the same as yours. My least, not my, when I say least favorite, I don't mean I didn't like it. I just mean out the ones we've watched. If I had yeah, to yeah. rank them, so at the bottom of my list, I've got the end of the world. Then mm-hmm. I've got Aliens of London. Then I've got The Unquiet Dead, World War Three, oh. Rose, and Dalek. Where's was, oh, is Rose before Dalek? Rose is second, Dalek is first. Of course, yeah. So Okay, sp- that's interesting. What is it? 
before we move on to Dalek, I was just wondering, what is it about World War Three that you think puts it above the first part, Aliens of London? It had more aliens. It had more Slovene in it. I re- that was something that, I, if you go back and you listen to that episode when we did four and five together, I really enjoyed mm. the Slovene. I don't know why. I think it was a good break, as in, we've had three really serious, three and a half really serious episodes. This is just a bit of a fun throwback episode almost. And I really like the aesthetic yeah. look of those aliens as well. I think they look really good. That's interesting because for me, I thought that I would actually probably say that I slightly prefer Aliens of London just because oh, right, okay. I really like, I just really like kind of like the world building of kind of tackling how people would react to Aliens landing on planet Earth. And I feel like that really played to Ripple T. Davis' strengths. Yes. And then the Slovene, whilst enjoyable aliens, in some regards, were a little kiddie slash a little dated in the CGI. Yeah, they were. That was one thing that did stand out. One thing that almost put um, Aliens of London a bit higher up was just a solid line of, excuse me, do you mind not farting whilst I'm trying to save the world? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was just such a good I'm line. such a kid. <laughs> Fart jokes are funny to me. <laughs> anyway, should we get into Dalek? Yes. Okay, so, so I we both. This... Sorry? Yeah, I find it interesting that uh, we both put Dalek as number one in our rankings so far. Yes, yeah, it, is, yeah. it was an episode I hadn't seen in a while, but I'll let you. I'll ask you what you thought of it first. Um. Well, without giving, well, I can't really say without giving too much away. Dalek is my favorite episode of Doctor Who, like all of Doctor Who. Oh, wow, okay. So we've, we've talked that early episode. for you. Yeah, mm. but it's, you know, I mean, series one is my favorite series. Eccleston is my favorite Doctor, and Dalek is my favorite Dalek story. My favorite Eccleston story, just it's my favorite Doctor Who story. Like, kind yeah, of pretty much, yeah, full stop. Cool. Um, there's just so much I like about the story. I love kind of just that kind of three-way dynamic between the Doctor, the Dalek, and Rose, and kind of how all those kind of each of those characters have a lot of scenes kind of between each other and kind yeah. of the way that shows lots of different sides to each of them. And the Dalek and especially and just there are some fantastic lines. There's yeah. Um, the whole setup of like the base um, is really cool, and just the way that the Dalek like kind of breaks down all of the defenses just shows how deadly this enemy is, and it really kind of shows why the Daleks are the Doctor's kind of number one, you know, enemy. And just yeah, I could rattle on and on. I love this episode, but I'll stop for now because you need to speak as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really liked it. One thing that really did stand out that I really noticed is that you start feeling sympathy towards it, mm, which is something that I really think is lost in a lot of future um, Dalek stories. You don't... You, you, they, I feel like the further the show goes on, they just become... They get menacing in episodes, but some of them you're like... Obviously, we can get into the, contact, the contractual side of why the Daleks have to appear in every series, but I do sometimes feel like they are just kind of forced. I almost feel like an episode's written and then they've gone, oh, that would be good with Daleks. We'll just put Daleks in that as well. But with this mm-hmm. one, it was an episode about that one Dalek. Yeah. And it, I just felt it worked really well. Could you actually um, explain to me the um, whole contract thing and how that works with the Daleks? I can, I can with take a go. I was kind of hoping you might know a bit as well. I know a vague, a vague amount. I know that which... like... The- I know the Daleks, they don't belong to the BBC. Do they belong to Terry Nation's estate? I, be- I, imagine, like I imagine it's very much maybe in the same regards as a Marvel Spider-Man contract. We're watching certain departments of Marvel own Spider-Man. I imagine certain departments of um, the BBC and Doctor Who own the rights to the Daleks. But I know that when they were reviving the series, there was concern that they wouldn't actually be able to use the Dalek in those newspaper headlines saying... They're not going to be back because, yeah, I think you were right. Within that 15-year gap, the rights had gone back to whoever had created it. Who did you say it was? Uh, I know the creator of the Daleks is Terry Nation, so I yeah. believe it's his estate that owns yeah. it. Yeah, I think they were, they were quite reluctant to hand it back for obvious reasons. But mm. I believe one of the um, one of the clauses in the contract is that they have to use it at least once a series. 
or at least right. once, um, not once a year, obviously, because sometimes it takes years off. But when they do a yeah. run, they have to use it. So that's even why in something like um, Series 10 with Peter Capaldi, um, there isn't a Dalek story, but in like the first episode, there's like one scene where there's a Dalek in a corridor. Oh, is there? <laughs> there is. So it's like, right, there you go. You've filled the Dalek quota for this series. <laughs> it might have changed now. I'm not 100 sure if it has changed because that sounds like a bit of a loophole maybe. But then again, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this was also but, um, so, oh sorry, go on. I just wanted to before we move on, I wanted to actually go back to another point you said about um how you can actually feel sympathy for the Dalek in this yeah. episode. Um and the scene that immediately springs to mind for me is this first scene between Rose and the Dalek, where I mean it's a little unclear as to whether the Dalek is kind of playing up the amount of pain. Yeah, I was wondering that, yeah. But I mean, just the way he talks there, like, so quiet and defeated. Yeah. And, like, the way that Nicholas Briggs, um, the voice of the Daleks, is able to kind of get that out of him, despite the voice modulation. It's just... Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's so good. And it is a shame that we don't see more moments showing, kind of exploring the psyche of Daleks in that way. But, yeah, um, yeah just that's... That for me was I forgot. I mean, there are a lot of moments in this episode where I forgot. Even though I've watched it multiple times, I forgot just how impactful so many parts in this episode are. Yeah, yeah. I definitely, um, even though we say we sympathise with it, it's one of maybe one of the only times as well where I think they really perfectly sort of show the evil of it as well. Like the bit where Rose mm-hmm. places her hand on its on its head, and it comes back alive, and it starts to feel all this hatred again. And watching it, you sort of get mm. a bit... Obviously, you're not scared by it, but you start feeling it, and you start feeling the tension building, and you start seeing that it isn't just this icon of the show. It's not just like the TARDIS or whatever, or the Sonic. It yeah. is this whole entity that does have its own sort of world. Yeah. I mean, in this episode, the dark's almost treated like like the villain of like a slasher horror movie, the way yes. it kind of like yeah, faces yeah. down the heroes and like chips off like is like killing all these soldiers one by one it's like this even like with just one it's really shown to be this super powerful entity that's like unstoppable yeah no yeah i did yeah. notice that when it's when it's almost like going level to level i was thinking this reminds me of something i'm glad you said a slasher film I, yeah i was thinking like sort of an, almost like a diehard where they're trapped in a building and there's a terrorist and they have mm-hmm. to defeat it and they're crawling through it. especially when um adam is it adam yeah adam mitchell Who's adam and rose the british guy yeah we get we'll get more yeah. into him next week because i found some really interesting stuff out about that character which we can talk about next time but um uh, okay uh, yeah so there's a scene where the two of them are running between uh, between closing doors and i was like oh this is very sort of what i would assume to be die hard almost with crawling through air conducts and elevator shafts and things like that. I think it plays up to a lot of tropes of different um, different sort of movie aspects, really. It's sort of a mini-movie in its own way. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's actually something that I know um, this isn't the right of the episode, but Stephen Moffat said in one interview that when it comes to thinking of a good story for a Doctor Who episode, yeah. um, he has to find an idea, but when he thinks of it, he thinks well, there's that feature film that I can't do anymore. Yes, no, I did see that. Yeah, he's sort of like every 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 Doctor Who episode almost has to be a feature film idea that you just throw out the window and use on Doctor Who. Yeah, it has to be a feature film in 40 minutes, yeah. I'm looking forward to the Aliens, uh, Love and Monsters movie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we'll get some Love and Monsters. I think it gets a bad rap. I do as well. I really, well, anyway, we'll save it. We'll save it. We'll save it. Um, yeah, I really we'll like get Chris's we'll get reaction it. to when he sees the Dalek. Oh yeah, that's really good. I think that's some really great acting from Eccleston. I think some of the best we've seen so far. Yeah, and especially because Eccleston obviously is an actor who, while he was aware of the show growing up, he wasn't like he didn't grow up as a fan of a show in the same way as actors like say David Tennant or Capaldi yeah. were. But so. It, 
to see him kind of treat this Dalek, you know, something which by this point had probably become almost a subject of ridicule towards the British public, you know, this yeah. silly little pepper pot on wheels. Yeah. And for him to treat it with such legitimacy, to act so fearful, so angry, it mm. that does a lot to kind of, you know, really bring back that kind of sense that the Dalek is not something to be underestimated. Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. I think they really use it. Well, one thing that I really did like seeing is I think the extermination of a Dalek and how when you see someone get shot by its laser, I think it just looks so good. That whole... Yeah. The, but the way the body freezes and you can see the skeleton and they light up green. I think it looks great. Hmm. Was that something that was in Classic Who? Was that kind of a new addition to? I, feel like, I think it's something Who? where they were people were originally just shot, and then over time it's developed into what it is now. So you could probably go back yeah. and watch a, a McCoy episode, and it would maybe be quite similar, but not one hundred percent bang on. Hmm. Talking of McCoy, in the um, Seventh Doctor episode, Remembrance of the Daleks from nineteen eighty eight, that is actually the first time we do see a Dalek go up the stairs. Oh yeah, I've seen that clip. Yeah, um, where that was like the actual cliffhanger for that episode. Oh, was it really? Up the stairs, and yeah, and then the dark starts floating up, and like, I think you get close to McCoy like looking in horror. And yes, you do. Yeah, you see like the like, oh, target. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, of course, it was a smart decision of them to reintroduce that in this yes. episode because obviously, by the time McCoy rolled around, Doctor Who had a much less prominent viewer base than it had in its heyday. So yeah. who was it? I imagine for most of people Sorry, go on. I imagine that for most of the people watching Dark in two thousand and five, this will have been the first time that they've seen the Dalek's ability to float and elevate. Oh yeah, definitely. And kind of yeah. And I know I that watching, like back... when I was watching Confidential, what do you say the guy who wrote it was called? What was his name? Robert Sherman. Yeah, he was saying that when he was writing it, he said the first scene he wrote was the scene where it goes up the stairs. He says, I have to put it in. Let me just write it, mm. and then I'll just stick it in somewhere where it works. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, mean, I guess that... it is an important thing. I mean, it is kind of, you can't underestimate that scene with the stairs because, like, until then... Um, the Daleks' inability to go upstairs was kind of one of the biggest jokes that were made about them in kind of pop culture. Yeah. So really it can't be underestimated what a statement that was to kind of show the Dalek ability to float, to kind of say, we're not messing around, this thing is dangerous, take yeah. it seriously. And that's one thing yeah. that I really did get. That, that same scene where it goes up the stairs and its eye moves and it's looking at Rose Adam and the and the army officer. Even though it looks so lifeless and deadly, even though there's no immersion to it at all, it's just a, a metal dome and a blue dot. That's all you see. Mm. But the way that it moves up the stairs for everyone who can't see me, I'm acting this out. But the way it moves up the stairs and its eye just stays completely still on it, the rest them, of its yeah. body moves. It's really quite eerie when you watch it. Mm. I think it's very interesting the um, shots in which you kind of see the point of view of the Dalek and kind of to think that this creature is being for all of its life, it's seeing the world through this distorted blue cold fish eye lens. And I feel like that does a very good job at putting you kind of, not entirely, but partly in the headspace of a Dalek and how this kind of cold, hateful killing machine views things yeah. and i feel like that then because you see so many shots like that throughout the episode it makes kind of the end when the dalek actually looks and sees and feels the sun with its own body and its own eyes all for more impactful yeah i never thought of that that view of it where it is that blue fisheye lens mm -hmm. you, you don't really think that that's how it sees the world even though obviously you know that's how it sees the world but that's all it's got until at the end of the episode where it does open up and you get the the actual Dalek, the little mutant thing with its eyes sticking out, feeling the sun. Mm. Yeah. And I have uh, to what? say, like... Sorry, go on. 
I mean, maybe we'll get to it later, but just the way that kind of, I guess, I'm, I'm assuming it was a puppet. The way it was designed was so good. Like that yeah. holds up so well, this kind of pathetic little thing with all of its like, ick and goo. Like it felt so alive. That was a brilliant piece of puppetry. Yeah, I think I can't, I'm not sure what it's made of, but I know the the little antennas and the little arms of it move by, and so they they have to put it inside the body of the Dalek, and then feeding mm-hmm. from behind that is almost like wires, and there's like two guys with almost like hand grips, like break brakes on a bike, and basically when they squeeze them, the arms and stuff and whatever it's linked to moves. Ah, oh, right. Yes, yeah, so I was. It, I, I think it's the only time I've ever seen anything like that actually done on a set. Normally, it's someone with a stick behind it or moving it or. I think yeah. Probably well, now it might like be done with animatronics, agree, but. Agree, yeah. Um, going back a little bit to Chris with his acting, is this the first time we see the Ninth Doctor actually attempt to try and kill something? Um. I think so, yeah. yeah. Like, he is actively wanting this creature dead. And, you know, you can understand his headspace. Like, to him, the Dalek is, you know, and it kind of is by design, the embodiment of hate and evil. It seeks only to destroy anything that's not itself. And to him, that's the creature responsible, perhaps the only creature other than himself responsible for the destruction of his home and his race. Yeah. Uh, definitely, yeah. yeah. Like, I think yeah, one I know... of Eccleston's. Sorry, go on. That's what the... we should call this podcast. Sorry, go on, because that's... we probably say it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's Wait, not. It's not, not just rudeness to, like... of me not enjoying Harry's opinion. There is a slight lag I feel um, on yeah. the Zoom call. So sometimes what feels like a long silence for us is only like a second. We should probably make a habit of allowing each other to stop. And like have a pause. We're we'll put our hands up when we finish. I'm finished now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, what do you think of the? Oh, sorry. You've, you got something to say? Yeah. Um. I feel like for me, like one of the standouts of Chris's whole short tenure as the Doctor is the scene where he just goes on, lets it all out at the Dalek over the intercom, telling him like, you know, kill yourself rid the world of your filth you know the iconic kind of why won't you just die yeah, and yeah. the way that the Dalek kind of punctuate, punctuates that with the phrase you would make a good Dalek is kind of how he you see his reaction to that and there's such a silence afterwards that for me is one of kind of the best character moments that his Doctor has in the whole yeah. series. Yeah, he's it's, it's quite, almost by the end of the episode, I know Chris described it as he's heartbroken at the end of this episode. When he's holding that gun, he just, he's broken. Yeah. He doesn't know. He isn't, he isn't the Doctor, is he? He's, he's sort of just turning. He's letting it get the better of him almost. Yeah. And I think that scene at the end as well, uh, well, throughout the whole episode, I know that it's quite hard to, you know, not focus everything on the Doctor and the Daleks, but I think Billy's acting in this episode, especially that last scene mm-hmm. where the Dalek opens Absolutely. up. I think it's, it's oh, I think it's one of the best performances of the season. Yeah, and she has some great dialogue there. I think she says like, he's like, say, she says like, you know, this isn't a hateful creature anymore. It's changing. Yeah. What have you changed into? Yeah. And I feel like there, kind of, kind of that scene there really kind of shows to me what the companion should be about yeah to me like the scenes where the doctor's companions are the strongest are when they are kind of offering kind of humanity to the doctor yeah i know you said you said quite sorry go on (laughs) no i i think i'm done yeah i know the very in the very first one you said um you liked rose because you can group companions in to whether or not they hold the Doctor accountable or not for what he does. Some idolise him and some, you know, hold him accountable. And this is definitely a scene where you see Rose sort of telling the Doctor what to do. Mm. And I feel like that really works, kind of, because at that point, the Doctor is almost at the same level as the Dalek. He's kind of riddled with this hate and anger. And that's a scene where he really does need someone like Rose to say, 
look at yourself, look at the way you're acting. Yes. No, mm-hmm. definitely. Um, we'll get into Adam a little bit then. What do you think of him? Um, being cynical in this, I feel like the main reason he's in this episode is to set him up being in the following episode. Yeah. I feel like when, in regards to this story, he isn't too vital. Mm. Um, he's fine. I've nothing against him. Um, it just, he never, I almost forget he's in this episode. Yes. No, yeah. Yeah, I thought he yeah. was only in the, um, the next episode, The Long Game. I only thought that was the only episode that he appeared in. Forgetting he does yeah. pop up in this one. Yeah, I think he's okay. It did make, there was points where, obviously, the character of Rose is semi-attracted to Adam. There's a scene where she's flirting with him in his office. I was thinking about Paul Mickey. Yeah. I mean, you can't help but think about Paul Mickey. Mickey gets such a <laughs> bad deal. Yeah. In this series, especially. And know, also, sorry. On, on the subject of that, I can't help but notice that the doctor actually treats Adam in a very similar way that he treats Mickey. Like, he's very dismissive of him. It's just like, you know, this silly boy who's yeah. below him. And, I'm starting to wonder whether that's the Doctor's actual view of them, or perhaps these younger men make him jealous, as yeah. if like he's having to fight with them for Rose's attention. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe. Yeah, because every um, young man that's come into the show, has the only reason they've really been in it is because they have an attraction to Rose. Hmm. And maybe he, he, we're still sort of unsure on the Doctor and Rose's relationship, but we know that he admires her as a companion and he wants her as his companion. Mm. So it, that maybe there's an element of him um, worrying that these will act as too much of a distraction. Yeah. And perhaps that kind of leads to an almost possessiveness on his part. Yeah, perhaps. And that's, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's something that the show ever kind of directly addresses. I mean, perhaps um, these big finish stories, maybe one of them will explore it a bit. That could be an interesting aspect to the Ninth Doctor's character, which could be interrogated more deeply. Yeah. It's almost Rose snapping back at him and sort of saying, you know, you don't let, you're not actually letting me do what I want to do. I've just, I'm, I come on this ship and I'm just stuck here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What did you think of Van, of the, the other villain outside of the Dalek, Van Staten? I think Van Staten works very well um, yeah. to kind of frame this episode. And kind of his, him as a whole character, like they could have very easily made a whole story with him as the primary villain. Like this guy who goes around collecting alien artifacts and actual living aliens just for his collection yeah. and to profit off. Like you could very easily, like, remove the Dalek and replace it with a more sympathetic um, a more kind of explicitly sympathetic Cree alien and make it just a story about the Doctor and Rose saving this alien from this insane you know corrupt alien collector yeah I like it when he refers to the Dalek he's like I've called it a Metaltron that's a good name isn't it and I'm watching it going <laughs> no that's dreadful that's a rubbish name <laughs> I know it kind of shows like how much of a ego he has yeah he's yeah such a bloated sense of self-worth i really like the scene that echoes on from what you just said where he gets a musical instrument and the doctor's really gentle and he's showing him how to use it and he gives it to van stratton and there's a moment where you saw there is that small connection between the two of them where van stratton's really enjoying playing this instrument and he's like okay bored of it now what's next and there's of course a thing where um there's a moment later on where it's kind of overlooked. It can be overlooked because of how quick it is. But as soon as he realizes the doctor is an alien, his first thing he does is kidnap him and tie him up. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, one interesting thing about that scene where he has the two, two things. One is a question. One's a, a, a fact. Um, the question is, is that the first time we ever see Doctor Who shirtless? Um, I think we might. When Paul Mc, when, uh, Sylvester McCoy regenerated into Paul McGann. We had Paul McGann walking around that hospital shirtless. But why, why do you remember that? Like, That's a weird thing to remember, Harry. 
I saw the Doctor Who movie when I was like, I don't know. Yeah, like, was... yeah, of course you did. You just replay that bit, don't you? <laughs> I actually need to watch the movie again for. We can do it for um, this. We can research. do it. We can do a special one day. It's a bit, I think yeah. I, I don't. I don't know if I. I know I've seen. I've seen it. In what concepts I've watched it, I honestly can't remember. Have oh, you watched the full thing? I know you have it on DVD because you've shown me your DVD of it. Yeah, it's just over there somewhere, so we can have to watch it. Another thing about that yeah. scene is when Chris is tied up. Is I think that's the scene in which. Chris isn't one hundred percent happy with that depiction of himself because I know that when he was on oh. um, the publicity tour for his current book, um, "I Love the Bones of You," he talks a lot about I love his the bones of you. Sorry, is it "I Love the Bones of You" or "I Love the Bones of Me" or is it "Of the You"? Bones of, of the bones of yeah, yeah. I don't know. In it, he talks about his mental health at the time and his body image. And he was always very conscious of how he looked because he was quite a skinny, you know, lot of, yeah. I don't know what the word I'm looking for. I don't want to say lanky because he isn't lanky. You know, um, he's just a thin guy. Yeah. He, um, he... Yeah, because I think he's a... Chris Regelson kind of naturally is usually quite a broad person because he's almost, usually much more broad shoulders and such. But yeah. um, throughout his life, he has struggled quite severely with a uh, body dysmorphia. Yeah, and his size has fluctuated. And I think one of the reasons why he's been resistant to return to Doctor Who, like one of the reasons, is that he was going through a phase where really he was like not at the best health, and he was kind of skinnier than was probably healthy for yeah. a man of his build. And so he associates the show partly with that stage in his life yeah and so i feel like that's a thing that's difficult for him to think back to and i imagine it must be tough especially considering that um like even like going into big finish all the all the photography and stuff they're going to use is photography from like when he did this series and when Mm. he was at that size that he was you know unhappy with yeah yeah i agree with that obviously we we you know, we we don't know Chris, so it's, I I you know I like talking about yeah. it, but I don't want to go too deep into it. But yeah, I can imagine if he was me. Lines too much. Yeah. What was that? Sorry. We don't want to read between the lines too much. Oh, but of course, into his mouth. Yeah. No. At, at the very start of the episode, there's a moment I really like where they get out and they're looking at all these alien artifacts, and for the first time in the series, and the only time, we see a Cyberman helmet. Ah uh, yes, the Cyberman. Yeah, and it's and, a. Uh, Is it from the 80s era? Yeah, it's it's the quite 70s? an early one. It's not the very, very early. I think it might be yeah. a, um, a Colin Baker style one. Mm. But I, it lingers on it for a long time, is what I noticed while I was watching it. I, I, when I was just thinking back to it, I just remembered it being in the background. Something like they just walked past and he looks at it briefly, then walks off. But he really holds yeah. on it. And it goes, you know, yeah. there's a shot of him, a shot of that, shot of him, shot of that. And then just a really deep close-up of it. Yeah. And I think it's cool that there's actually a shot where the shots of him looking at it, at the uh, helmet, but you can see the reflection of the helmet overlaid over him and his head. Yes, I did notice that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know enough about film theory or like (laughs) composition to say what kind of... mm, Intent. If there was some kind of intentional imagery or message in that, but it was a cool shot. <laughs> yeah, it was. It looks good. Yeah. Um, I also think it's very. Oh. Go on. <laughs> I watched. I think a year or so ago now a video essay talking about this episode, and they actually mention the scene with the Cyberman helmet and how it was very clever of them because if you go back to you know eighties Doctor Who and those like Cyberman outfits.
Hello everybody, we're back. That was a bit weird, wasn't it? Basically, my internet's a bit crap where I live, and um, it cut out, and I couldn't hear you very well, could I, Harry? No. So what I've had to do is phone Harry on my phone and hold him up to the speaker. So apologies if the audio for this last little bit isn't the best. Um, we'll try and wrap it up a bit shortly, but um, yeah, we basically well okay. So we'll, we'll summarize the episode. You really enjoyed it, didn't you? Yes, I love this episode. It's my favourite episode of Doctor Who so far. Yeah, it was one that I wasn't, you know, I didn't really remember that well. But when when I came around to actually watching it, and that's what I've noticed with a lot of these episodes, is when I'm watching them, I'm enjoying them more than I thought I was going to, which I think is a really good sign. I, um, because I've talked a lot of this episode, because um, I have a lot about to say about uh, Dalek. But I just have one question for you. Um, I know Dalek is your favourite episode of this series so far, is it your favourite episode of Doctor Who outright, or have we not got to that yet? Um, we haven't got to that yet. I don't know if I necessarily have a favourite episode outright. I have standout episodes. What right. that is of Series 1, I don't think I'll know until we finish. Right, okay. So you'll have to wait until we're finished with this series to decide what your favourite is. Yeah, just because so far there's been episodes that I didn't think I was going to enjoy that I've really enjoyed, like The Unquiet Dead. Absolutely. So, I think. Are there any upcoming episodes which you think could take this top spot over Dalek? What have we got? Um, possibly the Empty Child and that that whole Doctor two Dance. part story. Yeah, the Doctor dances. Maybe that. Um, perhaps Bad Wolf. Mm. Um, yeah. you, those two. Those two are the ones that I'm particularly looking forward to watching. Um, epi- next week's episode, the Long Game. Oh, uh, we'll get into next week because it actually isn't. We'll get to that in a minute. But the next episode we'll be um, li- w- watching the long game um, is one that again I'm quite apprehensive about watching. I've not watched it for a long time. All I remember is that there's a slug monster and Simon Pegg's there. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's not a nice way to talk about Nick Frost, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> That is a low, that is a, that is a deep cut. Nice. Let's hope Nick Frost doesn't listen to this podcast. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I think we both really enjoyed this episode, obviously, because at the start we ranked it as the highest, as our favourite episode of the series. Saying that, there hasn't been an episode I haven't enjoyed watching yet. Same. So, as briefly mentioned by accident a few seconds ago, next week is slightly different, isn't it, Harry? Yeah, for us. I mean, obviously, these aren't releasing at the same pace that we're recording them. We're actually... The last six episodes we've all recorded over, like, the span of a week. Yeah. So, but yeah. We're, because we're trying to... I would like... I, we've been recording them in order. I don't like jumping around episodes. So, next week, you're away, aren't you? That's right. I am going on a holiday with my family. Oh, lovely stuff. So next week, that means there won't be a standard episode. We won't be doing the long game next week. We're going to take almost a mid-season break. I'll be here. I'll be doing a special episode about something we've mentioned almost in every single episode with my friend Harrison. Um, We will be talking about Big Finish. Oh, interesting. Yeah, we're, we're both going to pick a big finished story we like and we're going to recommend it to each other, almost like a book club. Oh, cool. Yeah, so I'm picking... Uh, well, I won't, I, won't, I won't say the episode. I'm picking a New Who episode and Harrison is picking um, a very early big finished Doctor Who story, I believe. Oh, very exciting. So stay tuned for that. Um, there'll be videos throughout the week, as there always is, and I think... I've got I've got a few ideas of stuff we could do, but I won't spoil mm. them in case they don't happen. <laughs> uh, there is also a we also have the Twitter pages up. You can send us an email for whatever reason, and you can listen to this all over the place. Just go into the podcast description. And you can find it all there, can't they, Harry? Absolutely, absolutely. So I think we'll wrap. So, That's my fantastic. Uh, say so you're fantastic. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, slash Geronimo slash Alonzi. <laughs> cool. It's way more underwhelming. <laughs> so um, thanks for if you're listening this far. Thanks for sticking through the appalling audio of this episode. There's been problem after problem and edit around edit. Um, next time you listen, it will all be back to normal. So do you want to say bye bye, Harry? Bye bye. <laughs>
<laughs> I bet that sounded terrible. <laughs> People assume that time is a strict progression of cause to effect, but actually, from a non-linear, non-subjective viewpoint, it's more like a big ball of wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff.